Welcome to the Jax Rudolph Podcast. I am your host, Jax Rudolph, and this is episode 93, brought to you by the one and only, the legendary Black Belt Magazine. Now, I know that in recent episodes, we've been doing this segmented show where we do kind of the, the news and sport karate this week. Then we get into our main topic. We got the history highlight. We've got the Jax Rudolph Podcast Challenge. We are still going to have a new hashtag JRP challenge coming up at the end of the episode this week, but this is a film study episode. So the entire episode is basically going to be a history highlight episode where we're going to go through a ton of different performances, whether it be forms and weapons or point fighting, or maybe even a continuous fight from the Ocean State Grand Nationals, and these dates range all the way from the year 2000 all the way through 2016. We're going to have a lot of fun, and this is going to be a a big show on engagements. So for those of you that are turning in live, drop those comments down below. Let me know your thoughts on some of these performances as we go through the Ocean State Grand Nationals over the years. Of course, this tournament is promoted by the legendary coach of Team Paul Mitchell, Don Rodriguez, as well as his wife, and an all-time sport karate legend herself, Christine Bannon Rodriguez. It is coming up. We're just about two weeks away from the Ocean State Grand Nationals, their 40th anniversary. It's going to be wild. I cannot wait to be there. All kinds of exciting things going down. So in preparation for that, we're going to do this blast from the past and check out some, uh, some vintage and some relatively recent performances from the Ocean State Grand Nationals. So once again, going to be a lot of interaction this episode. Drop those comments down below. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the film study here today. So I'm going to share my screen. Let me get everything set up here. We're going to do a Chrome tab. We're going to click on YouTube and we're going to share. We're going to go full screen and we are ready to go. Let me make sure I got my formatting right. Perfect. We are ready to roll. And as you can see, we've got the one and only Reed Presley coming up first. And the reason that we're starting the show with Reed is because the Ocean State Grand Nationals back in 2016, as you see here, was one of my favorite divisions that I had ever been a part of. It was my first season as an adult competitor. Me and Cole Presley were moving up into the division as the new guys to face the guys who had been adults for a couple of years at the time. Reed Presley and Tyler Weaver. And it was just one of those crazy divisions where the energy was super high. Everybody was hitting their forms. And I wanted to showcase three of those forms. I'm going to be showing you guys Reed's form, Tyler's form, and then my form. I was looking for Cole's form from this tournament, but I couldn't find it on YouTube. So if anybody can find that on YouTube, definitely drop that in the comments down below so people can check that out. But this is 2016 Ocean State Grand Nationals musical weapons big shout out to sportmartialarts.com they are essential to the preserving of sport karate history with all the videos that they've kept over the years and uh, they're going to be bringing us a lot of the content today so shout out to sportmartialarts.com for the content and uh, we're going to dive right into it by taking a look at reed's form here and so as many of you know that are sport karate fans that tune into the show, Reed, obviously one of my best friends. He's going to be my best man at the wedding, one of my best men at the wedding. That gets complicated. Uh, but anyway, so obviously great friends and teammates with Reed, but we were great rivals over the years, him being the double bow guy, me being the single bow guy. Starts his form with his signature X out, kind of uh, sticking the bow between his legs. Very high level of difficulty. I love how in the back of this you see myself and Tyler on deck getting ready to go. Reed takes off. I love the hand roll on the 540 there. That was a nice touch that he added in for that season. Release behind the head catch, balances one bow on the other, right into the tricking combination. Cartwheel hyper full. That was another staple of his performances was that combo going into the cart hyper full. He has the little kind of magnetic pullback move there. I always love this section of Reed's form where he would put the bows together, act like he was doing single bow for a little bit. Reminds me of when Kalman would do that with double sword. He'd put the two swords together and do a little bit of a single bow set. Another one of Reed's signature moves there, the circus variation as he slid the bow off his body. And now he's coming into the last section of his form. Goes into a move called the Twirly Bird, which is an upgrade of a Magneto. I'm pretty sure you can tell why that's called the Twirly Bird. And uh, the signature intensity from Reed 
as he bows out. So great way to start the show tonight. You know, Reed, I always had so much respect uh, for everything that he did as a competitor and, uh, you know, just having the opportunity to share the ring for with him for as long as I did, as of course we did a commercial. Uh, but th those those battles that we had on stage were, uh, were super special to me and I'll never forget those. And then once uh, Reggie Miller and his Wendy's ad gets off the screen, we'll have a look at the comma form of Tyler Weaver. Oh, we're going to get the Wendy's ad twice in a row because of course we are. As soon as we start the podcast, we got to start getting hit with all the ads. I'm going to take this opportunity to take a look at any comments might be coming in. Michael Brume, thanks for tuning in, man, says, this is one division I wish I could have seen in person. It was crazy to be a part of it. This was a crazy, crazy division to be a part of. And so now we got Tyler up next. You know, one little fun fact as Tyler's doing his intro is that Reed at the beginning of that season was doing his form to X going to give it to you by DMX. Uh, and I always joke around that that was probably the worst decision he ever made because it would just get me so hyped. Like it was a great song for his form, but I would get so amped up listening to that song before I would take the stage. Tyler with the huge air at the beginning, big Jesus flip. That's one thing that Tyler was so, so good at was just the elevation he would get on his tricking. And then I mentioned Reed's intensity at the end of his form. Tyler, somebody who always brought a ton of intensity, as you can already see. And so Tyler takes off here, opening up with a few seven cuts, very high speed on the cut combinations, right into the releases, uh, throwing one sideways there. Now, if I remember correctly, I just kind of threw these videos into a random order as he hits the D-leg cork beautifully. I don't actually remember the exact order that we all went in, but I want to say that Tyler might have been first out of the trio of, of him, Reed, and I. And I say that because although he did have that one release combo over there, you'll notice as he gets to the end of the form, he did play it a little bit safe. He normally has a big release at the end. He's got the hyper full there. Then he goes, nice, uh, big, strong cutting combination. I love the creativity going to the knee. And he chooses not to do an ending move. He just kind of turns and goes into the finish there. Uh, but still a great performance from Tyler. And Tyler's been teasing that he might make a comeback to the sport karate scene. I picked him up on my fantasy sport karate team for that reason. So, Tyler, if you're thinking about it, man, get back out there. We'd love to see you back out there doing forms just like that. And then, of course, uh, I don't show videos of myself on the podcast very often, but I've got a couple of them today just because – Ocean States has always been such a special tournament to me, especially since 2012 when I got the call to be on Paul Mitchell. Um, you know, it's Paul Mitchell's home tournament, so it's always meant a great deal to me and, you know, kind of the relationship that I that I developed with Kevin Thompson over over his later years at this event. Um, there's just so much history behind it. Uh, and this, this here isn't even the finals. This is a division. So I take off here. And uh, this is one of my favorite forms that I've done, although I don't think that it's a perfect form. And I'm going to get to why I don't think it's a perfect form here in a second. I love that triple. That's pretty much exactly how I would like to hit the triples in my routine. I was really happy with that timing. I'm pretty happy with the striking uh, extension here. And you'll notice I'm kind of commentating this differently um, because it, it's weird watching myself because I think of the things that go through my mind when I'm watching one of my own forms or running one of my own forms. Um, but so far, I'm really happy with this performance. You know, I tell students all the time that there's very, very few forms in my career that I would consider perfect forms. I'm talking maybe two. And although this is one of my favorites, this is not one of my, what I would call a perfect form, because there's an adjustment that I had to make here. So I'm going to actually slow this down. And we're going to go into a quarter speed here as I go into this last combo. So I hit the 900. I was happy with how I hit that two and a half spin behind the back catch. And then this was the first tournament that I threw this upgrade. So I go to the finger spin. Notice how that was a little bit low of a catch, but obviously it didn't affect the move. And then see how the boat travels into me as I'm making the behind the back catch? That boat was not supposed to travel in towards me that much. The boat was supposed to stay a little bit further away from me so that when I executed the behind the back catch, I would spin into it. Now, is that something that the judges were going to know? No, it's not. Was that something that was going to get my score downgraded? No, it's not. I was very fortunate to wind up winning this division, uh, which is probably why I have such good memories of it. Um, but it just goes to show you that a lot of being consistent in sport karate competition is not about being perfect. I would never say that I was perfect in that form, but I made a good adjustment. And that good adjustment is what enabled me to be able to pull off the form and put me in a position to get a win. So that's a good message to anybody, any kids, especially watching from home that want to learn 
how to be a consistent sport karate competitor. It's not about being perfect. If you can strive for perfection, obviously that's what you want, um, but it's not about doing everything perfect. It's about making the right adjustments at the right time. So I mentioned that I had a couple of my own videos. This is the last one because I don't like to talk about myself on the show. I like to highlight other sport karate competitors. Um, but I mentioned how special Ocean States is to me. And this is probably my favorite like core memory from Ocean States. Um, this is when Grandmaster Kevin Thompson was still with us. He is uh, sitting stage side watching. You see all of my Team Paul Mitchell teammates over in the corner there supporting me. Um, and it was just so special to be in this environment, this atmosphere. I'm happy with the form, too. It was a fine form. You notice that as I got older and went to the adult division, I got a little bit faster than what I was in this form, uh, which is kind of cool to see that progression. But, you know, really, it's, it's, you know, it's just a form that I was happy with for, for 90 percent of it. And then, you know, the really special moment comes here at the end of the form. I get set up to come forward. There's the zero gravity move call it peak, uh, that I call the peacock when I spin it behind the back there. Catch the two and a half spins. I love the teammates in the background getting hype. And then as I do my signature move here at the end, I actually point to Kevin Thompson to kind of give him a little shout out there. The muscle pose at the end, that was also something that Kevin consistently did at the end of his forms. Uh, but, but aside from being able to do that to Kevin and kind of give Kevin that moment um, when we all knew that he didn't have too many moments left, he would pass away uh, just five years after this performance happened. Um, but what's so special about this performance to me is when you pause it right here and you look at the background, you see Coach Damon getting hype a few moments ago. You saw him kind of waving his arms. You see Cam Dawson over here getting hype. I love that. Mackenzie, Kyle, Cass, Sigmund, Tyler. I mean, just seeing those faces in the background and knowing that, you know, I had that, that family there to support me um, as a member of Team Paul Mitchell was everything. And it, it especially hits different knowing that at this Ocean State Grand Nationals, we're going to have a whole bunch of new players on Team Paul Mitchell, and we we kind of get to kind of get that that big team family vibe back together. And, and I'm just so excited for the future of the team and seeing this type of environment continue to grow over the years and continue to be the best sport karate team in history. Of course, I'm a little biased when I say that, but I think most people would agree that that is what Paul Mitchell has become with the 35 year history of the program. Um, so, yeah, forget the form that I did. Seeing that and that camaraderie and that family aspect of Team Paul Mitchell, that is why I will never forget that form. Um, and, you know, for it to be a form that was dedicated to Kevin um, just makes it mean so much more. The, the eternal captain of our team. And I love Coach Damon lifting his fist up with me there in the back. That's enough of me. We're moving on. We're now going to throw it back eight years to the 2008 Ocean State Grand Nationals. And, you know, I tell people all the time that one of my moments that I, that I kind of made Paul Mitchell notice me to get me on the team was at the Ocean States, not in 2008, this was years later, when Austin Crane was on Paul Mitchell. That's who we're watching right now. Um, and I was actually able to beat Austin Crane in the runoff. Uh, in front of, you know, the Team Paul Mitchell people. And that was kind of one of the things that put me on the map for them in 2012, early on in that season. Um, but I talk about Austin Crane as one of my favorite comic competitors ever. And you see why right now. You saw the release going into the kicking combo. And this is a very young Austin Crane. And, and the level of complexity in these moves, I love how he's got the switch blades on the end. That's a kind of a, a sign of the times there uh, to have the switch blades on the end of the commas. And look at the basics, too. The cleanliness of the cuts, the extension of the kicks, the stances. I mean, you just don't see that. To be that young as Austin was back in 2008 and to have that level of cleanliness and precision with his commas, um, that was truly unprecedented. And that's why he was one of my favorites ever. Uh, and it was really special to get to call him a teammate. Since we're talking about great comma competitors and we're not talking about State Farm, now let's transition to Rudy Raynon in 2008. He was still a junior at the time. This is the 14 to 17 Weapons Grand Championship. Based on the graphic at the beginning, I believe this video is credited to Black and Blue Video, another uh, hugely important contributor to Sport Karate's uh, preservation of, of the history here. And then I love the style of Rudy's seven cut, so wide, so powerful. I've said it on the show many times. Rudy is who I consider to be, in my book, the greatest comic competitor of all time. I just love watching Rudy. I could watch Rudy's comic forms all day. The creativity, the power, the effectiveness of his cuts 
do you watch these cuts? You know, some of the naysayers that sometimes tune in for us that say, oh, you know, sport karate is just dance. No, no, no. You stand in front of Rudy Raynaud's cuts and he is going to slice and dice you up. And that is the thing that I love most about Rudy Raynaud. So I had to throw that out there. While Rudy's finishing that form and we're getting a little transition here, I'll switch back over, check out the uh, comment section here. Absolutely, Kenny Simmons, thank you for tuning in. Looks like we're going to get a Gio Gonzalez form there. That's a, a good name for everybody. Now, speaking of great Team Paul Mitchell members, we've got none other than the current forms and weapons coach herself, Lauren Carney, an all-time great competitor. As many of you know, uh, Lauren Carney was one of my coaches coming up, taught me everything that there is to know uh, about competition. And this is Lauren in the forms division. A lot of times if I show Lauren off on the show, we're showing off her weapons work uh, because that's what she was most known for was for her bow. But of course, she ran excellent traditional forms as well. And this is Gopai Show. She won countless overalls with Gopai Show, which is crazy to think about now because now, I mean, you hardly ever see Gopai Show being effective in a tournament anymore because the WKF styles become so prevalent. Um, but Lauren had one of my favorite Gopai Shows. Um, the, the cleanliness of the execution, beautiful horse stance, the precision of the hand techniques, pulling down into the low back stance. Um, Lauren truly mastered this form like few, other ha few others ever had. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I love going back and watching this. And also Lauren's intensity. To me, that was the thing that made Lauren stand out against anybody she competed against was her intensity. Obviously, something she gets from her coach, Casey Marks, who's also known as one of the most intense competitors ever. I know that was a topic of discussion on uh, Jeff Doss and Alex Dingman's inside scoop this week. They were talking about some of the most intense competitors. Lauren Carney, absolutely in that conversation as well. And while we're talking about contemporary traditional forms that wouldn't win so much today, but they were huge in that 2006 to 2008 time period, longer than that, but this is kind of when we're watching some of these forms, we've got Will Cornell. And this is obviously from the eliminations, elimination rounds. This is not from the overall grand championship, uh, but I actually remember competing in this room, in this exact ring on carpet the first year that I competed at the Ocean States. Uh, so I thought it was a pretty cool perspective to watch Will Cornell. You see the beautiful, perfectly symmetric horse stance. And then I, I know that I've shown Will Cornell on the podcast a few times. I'll never get tired of watching Will Cornell. I, I am the biggest Will Cornell stand there is. I love watching his forms, those great diamonds forms that he had where he won multiple diamond rings. I think it was two, maybe three. Uh, no disrespect if it was three, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just love watching Will Cornell. And just this performance style of traditional forms, right? I mean, this is a, a hybrid form that was kind of designed for competition. The low stances, the beautiful high kicks really just shows his mastery of technique. Obviously, you know, a lot of the great WKF stylists of today that we see on the open circuit, like a Mason Stowell, a Joey Castro, a Gabrielle Dunn, uh, clearly they have excellent execution of their techniques as well. This is just a different way of doing it. And this is what I grew up with. Um, and I love to watch it. But I love watching a great WKF style competitor as well. And I actually used this in my rendition of Goju Shio Dai that I would run, uh, the way that Will Cornell did that transition there. I kind of took a page out of his book when I did this in my own forms. And as he's doing some of these low stances and the balance moves and showing off the leg strength, he's doing this on carpet. That carpet was a slick carpet surface. I remember competing on that carpet. It is not easy to keep your footing on there. And Will Cornell uh, obviously did it beautifully. And then the big intensity at the end, a trademark of his. You love to see it. And as he's finishing that up, I'm going to take another look at the comments, see who's tuning in here. Again, this is an interactive episode, y'all. So if you're enjoying the show, make sure you're dropping those comments. Let me know what uh, some of your favorite performances from the Ocean State Grand Nationals are over the years. And speaking of favorite performances, this video, courtesy of Flip Your Lid Wear, Ocean State Grand Nationals 2008, we've got the one, the only, Matt Emig. Let's see what Matt's got here. We've got an open form from Matt. This is my all-time favorite Paul Mitchell uniform. Notice this is the shampoo bottle uniform. He's got the shampoo bottle with the bow on the leg. He's got the ensemble of shampoo bottles on the back of the uniform. You love to see it. I wanted one of these uniforms so bad. And unfortunately, they discontinued them before I got added to the team. Uh, but it's just, it's my favorite Paul Mitchell look ever. As far as forms and weapons go, I've got some other fighting uniforms you guys are going to see later that I just love. 
Well, there's Matt. You see the beautiful tricking combo here right into the rodeo. There was nobody that could do that like Matt could, especially holding it as he did the extra rotation around. Right here, Brandy into the statue. Brandy just meaning the round off that he did without his hands. The ability to get the elevation off of that is just insane. Love the creativity there, kind of swinging up into the swing sidekick. Then, of course, the signature scissor round. Cheat 720 to the splits, going right into that little uh, spear hand technique and then finishing to the back like always. That is vintage Matt Emig. You, you can't get enough of it, right? Again, like I was saying, I could watch Will Cornell forums. I could watch Matt Emig forums all day. MattEmig.net. I haven't visited MattEmig.net probably since 2008. Somebody go visit MattEmig.net after this uh, episode and let me know if that's still a real website. I hope it is because I need, I need to go log in to MattEmig.net. And then, of course, shout out to FlipYourLidWear.com for that video. And let's see what we got coming up next. I know you notice we're keeping the show moving tonight. We've got, I think, 27 total videos to get through. So I'm not going to be doing a whole lot of replays. We're just going to roll through it. And then this is a single sword form from Kalman Choka, 2006. I love the little manipulation with the thumb spin of the sheath before he puts it down. And I like to show Kalman's single sword forms on the show as often as possible because, in my opinion, his single sword is what made his double sword so successful because what he was able to do was he could win divisions with his single sword routine and he would preserve his double sword routine so that people only ever saw it on stage. I am going to give us a replay of that move, the Lazy Susan, a classic sword move that I believe Kalman Choka was the original innovator of. Uh, we saw this later in his double sword forms too. Sword on the back of both hands, not touching the blade, right up into the release, catches it. Again, this is all without touching the blade. He may touch the spine of the blade, but never touching the blade of the sword, meaning that he's not cutting himself if it was a live blade. Again, rolling it, the spine of the blade was on the back of the hand there for that signature move. And then the basics, the cleanliness of the cuts, the speed, Kalman's intensity. There was so much that was so great about Kalman Choka. Uh, I know that I've said this for like everybody we've seen on the show so far, but I could watch Kalman's forms all day. Another shout out to the one and only sportmartialarts.com. Now, we saw Matt. We saw Kalman. Everybody knows about the great rivalry that Matt and Kalman had. Matt and Mark Cannonizzato also had some great battles. And one of the reasons that I picked this particular video is because he's wearing the Mitch uniform with the yellow stripes, which I believe was a special uniform that Mark Cannonizzato got uh, for doing something at the Martial Arts Super Show before Paul Mitchell was consistently attending that event. Mark had one year that he kind of went on his own and they had this special uniform for him. So there's a little bit of history behind that. If Mark or anybody that knows Mark well knows more of the story behind that, I'd love to hear it. And then I love this extended combo using the back ends of the commas. That's really creative. But again, really, I was showing this one to show off the uniform. But of course, Mark Cannonizzato, an all-time great comma competitor in his own right, uh, pretty safe to say he's probably in the top 10 comma competitors of all time. There was his signature X out, stabbing the commas between the legs as he executed it. And uh, again, I know I sound like a broken record. Never get tired watching Mark Cannonizzato or Yeti commercials. You know, Yeti, they make great coolers. They're not a sponsor of the podcast. If they want to sponsor the podcast, that'd be great. But they're kind of interrupting our show here, so I don't appreciate it. But that's what happens when we do a film study episode. What it does do is it gives me an opportunity to check out the comments here. Absolutely. I see Michael Brumet confirms mattemig.com still works. You love to see it. And now we've got Ross Levine in the Impex uniform with the Hakama on. Again, anytime that I get an opportunity to show off a Ross Levine bow form, I'm going to show it. I believe he might have even won the overall grand in adult weapons this year at Ocean States. I know he copped a couple of them in Ocean States in his career. Notice the ASG logo on the back, Impex logo on the front. And then I just love watching Ross work the bow. You see the reload there, catching with the left hand right into the swing. As Ross would say in his intro, no flips, no tricks, and no throws, just bow. And that's what he had the entire time. Striking combo, full speed into the finish. Everybody knows Ross as a fighter. Everybody should know Ross as an all-time great bow competitor as well. Love watching it. See him point at the camera at the end. You love to see it. And now we're going to move on to one of my favorite bow competitors that not many people have heard about, and that is Billy Ledger. This is 2008. Look at the level of difficulty that Team Straight Up's Billy Ledger is going to do in this routine. He just caught that in his arm, threw it the other direction. That was unheard of 
in 2008. 360 spin catch over the head, unheard of in 2008. The things that Billy Ledger was doing at this time were simply unprecedented. There was nobody doing anything like what Billy Ledger could do. I don't even know what that neck roll manipulation was that he just did. Comboing the Botrix together here, the swing. I love that little skull bash right into what I call the kill Bill. Throwing it from behind the back, flicking behind the back again. Comboed into the 540. It's, it's a work of art. You love it. I see the stab going straight in, creativity and the striking. And I think that's going to take us to the home stretch, the shoulder neck roll, big finish. I love watching Billy Ledger. What sucks is there's not many videos of Billy Ledger on the internet. There's this one from Ocean State, and then there's one from Pan Ams of 2007, I believe, and that's about it. Um, so you could kind of say that uh, that uh, Billy Ledger was kind of a folk hero in sport karate. Another sport karate folk hero would be Austin Jorgensen, who we see here in 2012. Now, I do have two Austin Jorgensen videos coming at you because this is the form that everybody knows him for, the drunken sword form. This is a legitimate style of kung fu. This is not a joke. Uh, drunken style is respected as one of the most difficult styles of kung fu to master, and Austin Jorgensen did certainly that, and everybody loved it. This is another one of my all-time favorite Paul Mitchell uniforms, the turquoise soft style uniform that Jorgensen had. Love the belly spin all the way around. That is so difficult to do, it's not even funny. Jumps up. And then one thing that I learned from Austin, because I roomed with him several times because we were on the team together. This is the year that I got on the team. Um, the steps that he takes when he's doing the drunk stumbling, I believe he referred to those as diamond steps. And there's apparently a very specific pattern that your feet follow when you're taking those steps. That isn't just incoherent stumbling. There is a technique to that, just like there is very clearly a technique to this. Look at this. Picks up the imaginary keg all the way back. That is so insanely difficult. Head touches the ground. And I believe that's going to bring his form to a close or very close to it. He's going to sell it a little bit more. And uh, we'll see him sober up here at the end. And that is the drunken sword of Austin Jorgensen. One of my all-time favorite routines in one of my all-time favorite Paul Mitchell uniforms. And now what we didn't get to see Austin Jorgensen do as much because he did it kind of late in his career was the monkey staff form, as we're going to see right now. Now, I also liked this look a lot for Austin, where it was just like the straight black with Paul Mitchell embroidered on the back. That was a really clean look as well. And the level of difficulty of this monkey staff form is just insane. Uh, one of the things that I'm more proud of in my time on the team is that uh, we actually worked together to come up with some ideas for some bow tricks that he could use when he was doing monkey staff. I mean, that's just crazy. That huge aerial using the staff to balance on. You could not do that with one of the tapered bows that the hard style is using competition. You've got to have this particular uh, Kung Fu staff for that. Climbs up, it looks around. And just like in his, you know, drunken style that you saw with the sword, the monkey style, you're going to see him. Oh, look at the extension on that kick. I got to show that again. But as I was saying, you're going to see him, you know, replicating the movements of a monkey throughout this form consistent with the Kung Fu animal style. Now, look at the extension on this kick he's about to do. This is insane. Catches the release, comes around, acts like a monkey, jumps up. Bam! The extension on that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. Forward roll, jumps over it right into the release. That is incredibly difficult to do. Into the one-handed figure eights. The speed of that with as heavy as that staff was. I held that staff. That is a heavy staff. The speed he just did those figure eights with. 720 balancing on the staff. I mean, this is, you could argue that this was more impressive than the sword form. I mean, he won the most with the sword form. But I absolutely love the monkey staff. Flicks it up in the air. Slams it back on the ground. Still acting like a monkey a little bit. Another huge front kick. That front kick even, even went out of frame. And then uh, that brings it to an end. I love me some Austin Jorgensen, man. I'd give anything to watch Austin Jorgensen in action again. I love, love, love watching this stuff. Speaking of fan favorites, we got one that some of you might not have expected to see tonight. We got Will Coney's from the Ocean State Grand Nationals. Will Coney's, uh, one of the top trickers to ever compete in sport karate for his really unique style. Um, obviously went and won the, was it the inaugural? I believe he won the inaugural Adrenaline Championship in tricking. So Will Coney's obviously a big deal in the tricking community and was able to throw it down on the sport karate mat as well. 
And I believe he made the finals with this routine. I remember watching Will Coney's in the finals. I believe this is his divisional round. We see the chop punch combination, keeping it nice and clean. And that's one thing. Sometimes you see trickers kind of make a debut in sport karate or come compete in sport karate, and they don't have very clean hands. The extension on his chop punches was good. And then look at that. The illusion, hyper illusion, landing on the kicking leg, swinging into the gainer. You see whoever that was sitting stage side, putting the hands behind the head, the kick full. You almost never see that in a sport karate form. And look at that, the pop 360 carry through. That's insane. The stuff that Will Coney's was doing in this form, it's just you would never expect to see it in a form. And that's why I got to give a shout out to Will Coney's. And now we're going to keep it going with some of the extreme forms here. We've got James Solis making his debut on the Jackson Rudolph podcast. I don't believe that we've ever shown a James Solis form, but I recognize James Solis from uh, my early years as a sport karate competitor when I had the rock solid training DVDs from Century Martial Arts and James Solis had one of those rock solid DVDs. And then for good reason, you see huge jump split kick, extension of the kicks is beautiful, beautiful hands, mixing it up. He's got the stationary kicks, he's got the aerial kicks. That's a rare combination that you really don't get to see anymore. And I mean, this form is just a work of art. Love it, beautiful pop front kick. And then the finish. Now, those forms in that era, 2005 extreme forms like that, were typically a little bit shorter. So you see a bit shorter routine there. But you can obviously tell the level of expertise that he put out there. Now we're going to rewind a year. We're going to go to 2004, where we've got Anthony Atkins. I love the full red uniform look. That goes hard. If I'm not mistaken, I just noticed this. And that purple jacket right behind him that might be a very young ryan wells that might be an old straight up jacket and that might be a young ryan wells which is crazy and i believe that's will canonizado behind him in another straight up jacket too but let's focus on anthony atkins the height on that is insane look at this boom huge sides i guess that's technically a side swipe typically we see a side swipe done for more of a tornado kick setup but he popped off of both feet executed the kick landed on the kicking leg Jumps right up in the camera there. Blows a kiss to the camera. You love that charisma. Huge flash kick. Oh, look at the split kick. Hold on. We got to see that again. Look at the extension on this split kick. You get, you get the huge flash. And then look at this. Look at the leg swing right up. Bam. Man, there's nothing like that. I don't think I've ever seen a split kick that I like that much. Steve Tirada had a gnarly split kick too. That Anthony Atkins split kick might have just taken the spot as my favorite split kick that I've ever seen. As now we're gonna get a movie trailer. And we're gonna skip over the movie trailer and we're gonna go to Daniel Graham, 2006 Ocean State Grand National. So kind of the theme at this part of the show is these great trickers in sport karate that we've seen, particularly in the mid 2000s. And uh, we're gonna get that from Danny Graham right here. Huge raise right into the swing gainer. Just the fluidity of that is insane. Made it look easy. And that is not an easy thing to do. Notice this is a comma routine. And jumping right up, another great split kick right into the full, full twist, hook right into the raise. Looked like he might have wanted to keep going there. Hard to tell. You did see a lot of combos in the mid-2000s in with a raise. Now it's almost exclusively a transition move. Uh, but you did see some combos back in the day. Huge side kick there from Danny Graham. Again, a lot of people respect Danny Graham most as a tricker. That was a nice traditional side kick done there. Does a little extra release at the end for some flair and then calls it a day. You love to see that from Danny Graham. Uh, reminds me of another uh, great tricker who became – actually, Danny Graham was one point considered the greatest tricker on the planet, much like another guy who is now considered the greatest tricker on the planet, Michael Guthrie, who also did commas and had some nice comma manipulations when he competed. But I digress. And now we go to another name that has not been mentioned on the podcast before. I tried really hard to bring in some new names. We've got Dan Pitlock. I still remember watching some of Dan Pitlock's forms. Again, another great tricker. That is a double full on carpet. Are you kidding me? A double full on carpet in form. Beautiful flash kick there. Good extension on the hands. Big axe kick right into the jump 360. Switching it up with the flare kick. And then the finish. Love me some Dan Pitlock. That's an awesome form. Highly recommend doing some Dan Pitlock film study. He was always super exciting to watch. And we haven't brought him up on the show before. So we had to give him that shout out here tonight. And then somebody that has definitely been mentioned on the podcast before. We've got the one and only Mike Welch. 
CEO of Team Infinity. Can't say head coach of Team Infinity anymore because he passed that down to Joseph Vine. Uh, but everybody in sport karate should know who Mike Welch is. Another one of my all-time favorite competitors. Always put on a show. And the basics, so clean. Beautiful stances. Full extension on the hands. Pop 360 right down into the back sweep. Love that combination. Huge sidekick. Love the basic kicking. You just The past several forms, we've seen beautiful basic sidekicks. You rarely see that anymore. And I love seeing that in some of these old school forms. The aerial going down into the split. Little bit of a stumble there on the knee spin, but that's okay. Beautiful landing, raise, punches to the ground as he lands. Again, you don't see those little intricacies of creativity anymore. And we got an old school logo there from sportmartialarts.com. And now talking about some of these guys that had great basics, we've brought Kim Doe up on the show many times for his extreme forms. We've even mentioned him for fighting, but we've never shown his Korean form. So as I was kind of studying some film and trying to find some good vintage Ocean States footage, I came across this video of Kim Do in the Korean forms division. And I had never seen this before until like midnight. Uh, I guess it was today if it was midnight, but you know what I'm saying. I had not seen this since last night. Showing off the balance, beautiful jump kick right into the punch. And I love when you see a competitor that was known for one thing and you find a video of them doing something, excuse me, doing something that you never even knew that they had done before and they execute it so beautifully. Obviously goes a little bit back out of the ring there. I don't think there's a penalty for that. That typically doesn't happen. A lot of time the adult division is competing on a stage, but anyway. I just thought it was cool to see Kim Do doing a uh, doing a Korean form, so I wanted to share that. And now, point fighters rejoice. We're going to transition to the point fighting part of tonight's broadcast, and we have Ross Levine, who we brought up earlier in the show as a weapons competitor with his bow form, against El Java Abdul Qadir, still out there killing it. I love to see both of these guys active. Ross Levine has made the transition to karate combat, his successful uh, first bout in karate combat after a historic sport karate career is what got him inducted into the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame recently. Um, so I love going back and doing some film study on Ross. And then El Java is one of the top senior fighters in the sport today. Ranked by the Black Belt Magazine rankings, always a threat to win those senior fighting grands. And so to see them going at it, Ross wearing the CJB uniform in all black, El Java wearing the victory uniform in the blue, which I love those victory uniforms, by the way. That's such a cool color blue to have on a uniform. And also a sign of the times. Notice the ring star shoes they're both wearing. Now I'm going to commentate the actual point fighting a little bit. You saw Java try to work a little fake there. Goes for the tornado kick. Doesn't look like it lands. Do they give Ross a call on the counter? Nope. Ross throws the D side. Java tagged over the top. Love the slow motion replay. Looks like the body punch got in there. And Java gets the body punch. And we'll see what the call goes that way. Ross with the hand scores. Then just a great chess match between these two. Ross fades back, throws up the D side. Couldn't see if El Java's landed or not. Looks like they went with Ross there. Ross throwing another D side as El Java's on the attack. The patented D side of Ross Levine scores again there. El Java working the fakes again. I don't think that landed. Do we, do we get a slow-mo with that one? Do we get a slow-mo with that one? I guess it landed. I guess that was bad vision on my part. Ross, I love that little sidestep and then attacks off the line. That was beautiful. He definitely landed that one. And then again, just to see both of these guys at this Ocean State, which I forget what year it was. Was it 2008 it said? I forget what year it was. But anyway, to see these guys going at it and know that they're still active martial arts athletes today, I just absolutely love to see that and be able to showcase that longevity. And Ross Levine would wind up winning that bout. I believe the score was 8-4. to four if I remember correctly, uh, but love getting to showcase the two of them. And while we're transitioning here, we see some shaking of hands and all that. I'm going to check back in on the comments. Looks like they were going to go to adult weapons there. Let's see what we got. All right. We don't have any questions or comments yet, but hey, we're doing great on time in this show. So if you guys got any questions, feel free to drop them down below. We're going to keep Ross Levine on display for a minute here as we show a Ross Levine and Damon Gilbert bout. This was the second round of a team fight between Team Paul Mitchell and Team CJB. Obviously, Damon representing Paul Mitchell at the time, as you can see him on the left of your screen, and then Ross wearing the CJB. And then one thing, that uh, this clash in particular, I think, coming up, 
is where you really uh, – well, hold on. As I was talking, we might have skipped over it. You get to see the intensity that Damon fought with right here. So was, that was almost like a kickboxing combination. You see him nodding his head after it, throwing the rear leg round kick. That is vintage Damon Gilbert. And that was one thing that made me a huge Damon Gilbert fan was just the toughness and the energy that he fought with. Um, and, I mean, Damon and Ross, I mean, these are two of my all-time favorite fighters to watch. And so watching them go at it against each other, this match ends up in a 4-4 draw, I believe. So good that I don't have to show one of them losing. But, uh, anyway, love watching these two go at it. Just like the other one, a chess match of a point fight. And then, again, respect the fact that these guys are fighting on carpet. That is so hard to do, especially with the high-speed movements that you need, the push-offs needed in point fighting. You see Damon calling his point there, lifting up, and he did score there. Damon on the attack again, but looks like Ross was able to sneak in with the hands. Sidekick. Oh, doesn't look like there was a call there. I thought that sidekick might have gotten in. I know if Coach Damon was coaching himself in that fight, we would have heard a two, two, two in the background. And then a little bit of confusion on that clash there. Both fighters looking a little bit confused after that one. Damon going for that kind of lead hooking jab, maybe more of a ridge hand there. Couldn't tell what happened, but that fight ends in a 4-4 draw and really cool to be able to highlight both Damon Gilbert and Ross Levine there. And uh, now we have a word from the Navy Federal Credit Union. Before we move on to our next match, uh, since we showed Damon, we're going to show another Paul Mitchell fighter. We've got Alex Lane, this time taking on Ahmed Farouzi. Love watching both of these guys fight, too. Ahmed's one of my favorite lightweights ever. Alex Lane, of course, one of my favorite uh, heavyweights ever. His length was just incredible. I mean, look at this guy. The length that Alex Lane had, trying to throw that sidekick in there. Did he get it? Doesn't look like he got the call, though. I thought that sidekick might have landed. Might not have gotten full extension, which is why they didn't call it. Alex tries to fire the reverse punch. Ahmed attacks. And they go with the reverse punch of Alex Lane. And then that signature kind of diving over the top ridge hand of Ahmed. I believe that will score here. But see, this, this is a clash that I'm like, and again, this is no disrespect to, to Hamed, right? But when you look at it at full speed and at slow-mo, you have to wonder, like, is this a technique that should be a scoring technique, right? So you're going to see him dive in off the line, boom. So it comes over the top. Yes, it does hit on the top of the head. But by the time it hits, I mean, this is a bent arm, kind of like just a tap over the top of the head, right? And Ahmed used it very effectively, and it was considered a scoring technique, and he scored with it a lot. And, you know, you play by the rules. I met with scoring like he, you know, was being rewarded for that technique. So he threw it. He threw it effectively and it worked and it scored him a lot of points over his career. But it's that type of thing that I look at and I'm like, should that be a scoring technique? It's an interesting debate for you guys to have down in the comments. And now here's one of the reasons that maybe slow-mo might not be the best thing for point fighting ever. Because you look at that last clash, you look at it full speed and you're like, oh, well, somebody had to have scored there, right? Like it's a clash. And what you notice here is Alex Lane is going to get the call. Looks like I, you know, rewound a little bit too far, but check this out. So it's the next clash. Boom. Both fighters come in and Alex punches through Hamed. He doesn't hit Hamed. He punches straight, straight across him. And Alex got the point. Now, Alex is my guy. He's Paul Mitchell. I want him to get the point. But it's like when you look at that in slow-mo, if you haven't watched point fighting before and you see that punch go straight by Ahmed, you're like, wait a minute. What was the scoring technique? Um, and I know point fighting happens at a really high speed, but I do think that that's one of the areas that, you know, maybe having instant replay could be, and of course our sport is a long ways from this, but having instant replay could actually help in those scenarios. Because I think that if you're in the nighttime finals and you have an instant replay element, then I think you give the coach one challenge per fight. You only do it in the finals. If you did it before the finals, tournaments would take way too long. But you have the instant replay in the finals for the limited number of fights that are there, as they see a slow-mo here of Alex trying to get the reverse punch in, but Ahmed lands that jumping defensive sidekick. But you have the instant replay in the finals. A coach can give the challenge. You go back to the instant replay. And on a clash like that, you'd be like, oh, man, that punch went by Ahmed. It didn't actually hit Ahmed. And so that point doesn't happen, right? And I think that that would be an exciting element that would help judging be better because if a coach notices that that technique didn't land from their angle, the center ref would have the opportunity to look back at it again and it would provide kind of this great suspense around like, did it score, did it not? Just like when you're watching a football game 
and you're getting near the end of the game and there's something under review, there's this big anticipation leading up to it. I think that would be interesting. But of course, there's a whole lot that's got to happen before we get there. And then another, you know, core memory for me at Ocean States is anytime that you get two Paul Mitchell guys making it to the final, as we see here with Cass Sigmund and Zolt Marotti. As you all know, I'm a huge Zolt Marotti fan because I've shown him on the podcast many times before, but I have not gotten a chance to showcase Cass Sigmund yet. And that's the reason I wanted to show this fight. Yes, Zolt is going to go on to win this fight, but in this fight, Cass proved that he was one of the best heavyweights in the world. And I've heard Cass talk about before how that's really what he wanted to prove was at some point in his career, he wanted to be the best heavyweight in the world. And at one point he goes up on Zolt, who's in many people's books, the greatest European fighter ever, right? Certainly the greatest European fighter to make the transition over to NASCA and win on NASCA as well. Um, and Cass had a 6-3 or 5-3. He had a lead on him at one point in this match. Um, and I think that Cass shows off a lot of really good skills in the early goings of this fight. You see his speed. You see his movement. You see his athleticism. And then one thing from, you know, you're not training with Cass, but getting to see Cass at Super Show and stuff like that. When we went to the Cayman Islands together, uh, the dude is just so strong. It's not even funny. And so getting to watch these two guys go at it. I mentioned earlier, there are some Paul Mitchell fighting uniforms that I love. This is one of them. I love the plain black with just the Paul Mitchell logo on the back. It'd be cool if we brought back a Sea Gear uniform, a Century uniform that was just kind of the plain black like that. I think that'd be really cool. Uh, but anyway, again, wanted to give a chance to give a shout out to Cass Sigmund, another one of my all-time favorite fighters, one of my all-time favorite teammates. Love watching him fight. And then, of course... I know I've talked about Zolt on the show before. Zolt's been on the show before, so you guys know how I feel about Zolt. And uh, getting to highlight a Zolt win is always a good thing. Uh, but it's not too hard to find because Zolt won a lot of karate tournaments. But anyway, so you see Zolt there. And one thing, and I think you get to see it now, he takes off with the blitz there, which you love to see from Zolt. He did that a lot late in his career, starting to work his blitz more instead of being too dependent on his kicks. But one thing you see throughout this match, and something that Zolt was such a master of, was being able to hunt people down with his leg. He could continue to push you back and push you back and then be precise with if he landed that hook or that round or that side or that axe, whatever it was that he ended that combo with, his precision was, was unmatched by almost anybody that I've ever seen. And so there you see the end of the first round. This is the heavyweight overall grand championship. And so we'll see the second round here. Cass working the kicks himself a little bit, gets out of the way, shows off the movement, tries to throw the spin hook kick. Would have been crazy if that landed. I think he was expecting Zolt to maybe take off on the blitz there because that's what Zolt did last time they got up into that corner. But Zolt stayed back and uh, fortunately for Zolt did not eat that spin hook kick. Good. And then that was, I love that. That was a very like European movement there from Zolt that like put down the leg, fake the, fake the back fist and try to come back up with the kick. I love that. That's something you see Bailey Murphy do a lot now. I see Bailey try to throw that technique a lot, but I've seen a lot of the Corrali fighters try to throw techniques like that before. Um, I've seen Roland Verez go for that a lot too. See Zolt once again, leg up right away. That chamber is so high, so hard to get around. Cass doing a pretty good job of managing it though. Cass fires back with some kicks of his own, tries to fire in a reverse punch there. Couldn't tell from this angle if the reverse punch actually hit. It did not. Cass fakes that little skip up sidekick there, plows through the hook kick attempt from Zolt, trying to land with the hands. Looks like the judges saw that hook kick, maybe get Cass right on the back of the head. They called it Zolt's direction. Cass tries to answer back. Mr. Jahanvas saw it. The others did not. Zolt gets the call. Cass tries to take off again, trying to gain some ground here. Zolt goes for that quick little defensive sidekick and gets called again. And so Zolt did start to pull away at the end of this fight here. But in my opinion, Cass really did fight Zolt Welt in this fight. Zolt just got Zolt just wound up catching him with a, you know several kicks at the end and kind of spread things open a little bit. But when you fight a great kicker, that can happen. Zolt needs a little shin pad adjustment here. Cass walks up to the front of the stage to see what the score is. There's only a few seconds left, so we're going to get one more clash, and that's going to be the end of the match. And here comes that last clash. Cash tries to throw the spin hook. That's the end of the fight. 
Obviously, Cass a little bit frustrated there. He took a loss in a, in a situation where he really wanted to try to get that win. Uh, but, you know, these guys were great friends and teammates. And, you know, that's one of the things I like most about watching uh, two Paul Mitchell guys fight on stage together is that you see that mutual respect between them. Um, and uh, it's, it's just always cool to see that. Again, I'm a Paul Mitchell guy, so I'm biased to think that it's cool to see two Paul Mitchell guys against each other on stage. But I digress. Man, the podcast has been filled with ads tonight. Before we get to our last clip of the evening, let me know what questions you guys have about anything you guys have seen tonight. Drop those questions down below. And now we've got the year 2000, Trevor Nash in the Team Elite uniform fighting in continuous fighting against Corey Waiters. And uh, this is continuous. And this is a year that Ocean States was an NBL event. So you're going to see an NBL rules continuous fight here. Um, and I kind of got the idea for this. I was watching Inside Scoop and they made a comment. I think it was Jeff Doss made a comment about watching Trevor Nash fighting in continuous. And this is what he was talking about. And look at that. Look at how easy he gets that leg up there and throws that axe kick. Trevor Nash, one of the great kickers of all time. I said this all, all throughout this podcast. I could watch this all day. I can watch this all day. I could watch Trevor Nash kick all day long. There's nothing like it. Trevor Nash throwing that ridge hand coming over the top, but maintain the full extension of it, which is what I like to see. Maybe gets a little antsy diving for that ridge hand, comes up short. And then that front leg just so fast. Axe kick comes out of nowhere, followed up with the hands. They got a little, uh, they get tied up there. And then at one point, there gets to be kind of a break in the action. It takes a little while as they're trying to figure out some type of arbitration. So I might try to fast forward that as we get to it. I think that that's the point of the match that we're at now. Yeah, there's some kind of arbitration. We're going to fast forward past the arbitration stuff. And then again, you see that leg of Trevor on display. And then, you know, a lot of times you see continuous fighting nowadays just kind of become a slugfest where guys do this. And they just get in there with each other and bang with the punches. And it becomes somewhat more of a boxing match. And you don't see a whole lot of kicks get mixed in. But notice Trevor is making his approach consistently with the leg. He's using that leg, pumping that leg as if he was in a regular point fight. And then following that up after landing on a few kicks, following that up with the hands so that he can rack up the continuous scoring. And then you see some of the boxing of Trevor there. You saw him throw the up. And then look at that. Comes out of the comes out of the clinch there, throws that round kick over the top. Looks like it might have clipped or it might have missed, but either way, the ability and the presence of mind to just come out of that clinch and start throwing that round kick right away, and the height and the accuracy of that kick is really impressive. And then when I first watched this, I thought that that ridge hand clipped the back of his head, and I thought that that might have been a knockout, but no, he just fell down. Would have been cooler if that had been a knockout. I guess I don't know what the NBL rule would have been if that had been a knockout and continuous. Then look at this. He throws the cartwheel kick, and then look at this. So Trevor kind of knew that he was going to win at this point, right? But one thing I love is that when he goes to throw this cartwheel kick, he keeps the base leg planted. He keeps the kicking leg up. I'm going to have to fast forward to it here. We're going to be watching slow-mo forever. Look at how hard this is to do. He doesn't wind up hitting the round kick, but this just shows how good Trevor Nash was. Look at this. He fakes it. He jumps back. That gives him the spacing he needs. Now he sees his opportunity. He sees what the reaction is going to be. He goes for the cartwheel kick. He wants it. He comes up short on the cartwheel. Look at this. Keeps the kicking leg up. Throws the round kick. Looks like that might have caught him on the forearm instead of actually getting up to land on the chin. But notice he does land on that on that follow-up right hand. Well, let's watch it one more time. So you see Trevor. He fakes it. Then you see him. I don't think this is a fake. I think he wanted it and said, eh, not yet. And then now he goes for it. And then look at this. So he keeps the kicking leg up. He throws the kick, doesn't land. Watch the right hand. But comes in with the right hook, lands right on the jaw. That's beautiful, right? Didn't get the cartwheel, didn't get the follow-up kick, but he continues to follow up with the hands. That secures the point, and that's ultimately going to get him the win in this continuous match. And if I haven't said it already, Trevor Nash, another one of my all-time favorite fighters to watch. And uh, since I've said it, I'll show. Can never get tired of watching Trevor Nash. But anyway, that's going to be my, my new catchphrase on the podcast, I guess. But that is going to do it 
for our film study episode tonight. So that was 27 sport karate clips. Lots of great memories. We went from it being daytime to it being nighttime. Now you can see my reflection of, of my computer screen in the uh, in the window there. And thank you all so much that have been tuning in. Now we've got the hashtag JRP challenge for this week. We've got our challenge of the week. And since we were doing a film study episode, here's all you have to do for this challenge. You gotta go on YouTube, you got to find an old school sport karate clip from any tournament. And for it to be old school, let's say it's got to be, be, it's got to be, let's say it's got to be pre-2010. So 2009 or earlier, you got to find a sport karate clip, a form, a fight, doesn't matter. One of your favorites, copy that YouTube link, post it up on Facebook and tag me and put the hashtag, hashtag JRP challenge. And you've got a chance of having your name and maybe even your video clip featured in next week's episode of the Jackson Rudolph podcast. By the way, you guys really don't want to miss episode 94. We've got a pretty special guest plan for episode 94 right before the ocean states. And I'm really excited about it. I'm hoping that everything works out and the scheduling works out so we can make the episode happening. So stay tuned for that. Episode 94 is going to be pretty hype. But don't forget, submit your hashtag JRP challenge this week. This week, submit that hashtag JRP challenge again. All you got to do is post an old school sport karate video and tag me, put hashtag JRP challenge, and you could be featured on the show next week. Another update. Some of you might have seen this come through on my personal Instagram or Facebook story over the last 24 hours. At the Ocean State Grand Nationals, of course, I'm going to be there. And I'm teaming up with Century Martial Arts to give out a few free signature series bows. So Jackson Rudolph, competition quality, signature series bows from Century Martial Arts. We're going to be giving them away. We're giving them away. That's like $100 value for free at the Ocean State Grand Nationals. Now, there is going to be some rules to the contest, but come to the Ocean State Grand Nationals in Warwick, Rhode Island, and you're going to have a chance to win a free signature bow from yours truly. I'll give it to you myself. If you want it signed, if you think that'd be cool, I can do that for you too. I might know a guy. I'm just kidding. Anyway, you don't have to have it signed. You just go compete with it if you want to. But anyway, that's going to be super cool. So if you're interested in that, make sure that you're staying tuned to my social media uh, for more promotion. Also stay tuned to Century Martial Arts social media for more promotion. I'm actually going to be doing a full takeover of the Century social media that weekend. So you'll see my face a lot on the Century page, uh, kind of promoting the Ocean State Grand Nationals. We're going to do some live streams with some of my commentary in the background. So I'll be like live streaming a division, kind of breaking it down like you've seen me do at the AK Warrior Cup or the Compete Nationals Battle of Atlanta last year. So I'm going to be doing some breakdown commentary like that live on the Century Instagram, maybe on the Facebook too. Let me know where you guys want to find that best. So there's just a few updates from the, uh, I guess, the world of Jackson Rudolph, if you will. So don't forget the JRP challenge. Don't forget to stay tuned for more information on how to win a free signature series boat from Century Martial Arts. Once again, thank you all for the love and support. We couldn't do this podcast without you guys tuning in. If you guys have new ideas for new episodes and new guests you want to see, new videos you want to be featured on the podcast, Drop those down in the comments below. If you've got any questions about any of the performances that you saw this evening, go ahead, drop those down in the comments below. And most importantly, if you enjoy the show, hit that share button and share it with all your friends so that they can uh, see the glory that is sport karate. So that's it for tonight, folks. That is your Ocean State Grand Nationals Turning Back the Clock film study episode 2000 through 2016. And if you want to see those forms from 2022, make sure you're at the Ocean State Grand Nationals or tuning in online to some of the live streams that are going to be coming out. I'm Jackson Rudolph. That is episode 93 of the Jackson Rudolph podcast, and I'll see you next time.